the we got the fit coming up. Just to mention it again. <laughs> yeah, you're looking so, for a new partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. After this chat, is this you breaking it, now... breaking it down gently? Yeah. yeah. So Tom here, another podcast episode. Looking forward to this one. It's interesting. Last week we were going to do a a podcast on the pairs. And I'm glad we didn't because it seems like this last changed. week <laughs> they've all changed. Yeah. Um, and it's it's going to make for quite an interesting next few tournaments or, or next couple of months, I think, in, in the, the Premier. It, like with always, when there's one change, there seems to be two. And then suddenly there's like five or six changes. So in this episode, I think we're going to talk about all the changes in the men's pairs and, and what our thoughts are on those men, men's pairs. We're going to talk about what the Paddle School have been up to recently in terms of the sessions that we've done and also what we've got coming up. We've got quite an exciting course that will be coming out on our platform, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, let's jump into it. Yeah. So, How's your week been? <laughs> oh, well, it's nice to catch up with you. Yeah. Nice to, it is uh, good. Yeah, to catch up. No, it's been it's been a good week actually. I played a tournament last weekend, which mm -hmm. was which was fun. It's always nice to get out on the competition court. It's quite. I mean, it's quite an intense match count in the tournaments we have here. You know, you play three matches in one day, yeah, uh, and then two matches in the following day, and and for me. Yeah, I'm just I'm not used to that volume. You know, the the, the start stop. Um, I think that's it's quite tough. Even though the matches aren't that long, you know, the warming up, cooling down, warming up, cooling down. Three matches in a day, I find that quite physically physically tiring. Uh, but it's it, I mean it's great because you pack in so much paddle in the space of a weekend. So I can't complain in in that sense. But it was it was it was fun. I enjoy always enjoy competing and. Um, yeah, we, we learn a lot. I think it's difficult, isn't it? In, in all these countries where the game is emerging, you, you end up, these tournaments, you end up having one or two rounds that, that the level is, is a bit hit or miss, isn't it? You know, it's often, you know, low level matches to begin with. And then suddenly out of nowhere, you've got quite a tough match. I think that happened to you, didn't you? You had two or three relatively easy games and then suddenly you're playing, you know, some of the British team players. Yeah. And and it's it can be quite a, I want to say a shock to the system, but you, you go from being extremely comfortable to suddenly playing you know, quite a fast match on your third match or, or second match or whatever it might be on the day. And so it's not easy to adjust. I suppose you could argue it was a bit like that in futures or challenges. You know, you might find probably more so in qualifying, less less in the main draws, right? But it's not easy to adjust. I think you've almost got to take each match as it comes probably, right? Well, I think the tournaments have evolved. I mean, when, when you were playing them in the UK, five six years ago i think even getting to the semis and even the maybe the final was the only match where yeah yeah the, the, level the was... only, final was the only match where we would have a, a good game yeah uh, and actually it's it's it, starting to change now i mean it's quarter, yeah. quarter finals you know not to say that the matches before aren't a good game i mean it's just but they're there's definitely a level, there's a level difference. You know, there's, I, I feel like, you know, that it's just a very big step up from that that level below at the moment while the game's growing. Yeah, and I think the more players that play, the more players that convert from tennis, the more challenging games there will be. And, and that was always one of the things that I find difficult is justifying going somewhere for a long weekend to play three or four pretty easy matches and then have one tough one in the final. At least now, there is a bit of prize money on the events, they're a little bit bigger, you get good games. Um, it makes it more worth it for players to play, I think. Um, and so so it's definitely going in the right direction. I think it was interesting, I had a, I had a chat with uh, the guys that I played in the second round and they're, they're based in Bristol. And for them, it's really difficult because they just said, like, we're, we're in a location where there just aren't the players to play against. Mm. And, and it's almost from the flip side of that, they said, we suddenly play you guys and it is just, so far above our level and they said how do we even start to think about playing at your kind of level when we just can't play with anyone ar around that level where we are and you know they said the only option is to play these tournaments but they come and feel like you know they really struggle to just get get in the match to, to be honest i think it's the same i find that or i i found that for the last seven eight years playing you know with the, the british team we might play tournaments here or in dubai and we go to a euro championships and and it's the same i'm like wow god this level is is such a step up from what what we're used to and it's it's really difficult that i remember last time we went to bristol and i had a i did an advanced clinic and there were there were three or four on there that i thought oh you know with potential you know in time these guys will be good but, but then it's like well, where do they where can they train or how can they how can they reach that potential when 
A, there isn't any coaching there, and B, there's not the people to play against. So it is it is really difficult. And I know a lot of these countries have had something similar. I know the Swedes was the same, right? Their top four or five players all went to Spain and they reached a kind of critical mass and then came back. And then now suddenly they're able to do this training in Sweden. I mean, I say now, it actually was probably about two years ago that they that they moved back. But I think you've got to reach a mass of players. It's a bit like our British team. You know, most of them are going to Spain to to get good training, to, to you know, play against lots of good players. And, and we're a little way off that to be honest, which almost brings me into, <laughs> into my week, which was, uh, you know, I did a coaching session at one of the David Lloyds at, at Rains Park, and it's, it's three outdoor courts, which obviously it, it, it rained all day. Um, so as most paddle players have to be that have outdoor courts, it was a very, you know, they were very hardy. So yeah. we, you know, we were out there in the rain. No glass. Sopping wet balls, <laughs> you know, the glass just slides. I finished that session and I thought, how are we getting more players in the game? You know, like my first group there, um, I remember there was a, a female tennis player who was good as a junior growing up. She's roughly my age, but, but you know, a very good tennis player coming into paddle and I was sat, you know, having a chat with her and I said, oh, you, you know, she's been playing paddle for a year and a half, but had no one to play or no one to coach her. And it, you just think how, how are we getting that critical mass of players? I mean, it's really difficult. Yeah, the access, well, I mean, it's those outdoor courts in this country with our weather is nine months of the year is, is a struggle, isn't it? Well, it, it's, it's an ongoing problem it, because, because the courts are outdoor, you can't really have a full-time coach there. And if you don't have a full-time coach there, then the players aren't going to get better. And so there, there, there builds a frustration there that, you know, and, and some of these locations, I think people in the UK, the game is so new that they don't understand the importance of having a covered structure. They think it's like tennis. If it gets a bit wet, it's fine to play. But actually, it's quite different from tennis. When, when the balls get wet and the, the glass is wet, it significantly lowers the the game. I mean, the, the, the level of the game, you can't use the glass. It, it, you can't return the serve if it bounces off. It, it, it really changes the dynamic and I think People are so focused on, you know, quote unquote, land grabbing and building courts here and there and, oh, there's a space there, let's just throw down some, some paddle. They're not thinking about the coaching programs, but they're also not thinking about almost future proofing the development of the game. And yeah, I came away from that thinking, you know, again, just thinking we, we need to focus on indoor courts, educating our coaches, like growing this before we can grow good players. I mean, I'm sure that they'll come together, but it's uh, it's not a quick process. The the frustration side, I actually have quite a few tennis players, like friends also who are ex-professional and they've taught us about getting into paddle. And it's exactly that, where they played a few times, really enjoyed it and thought, right, where can I play? Where can I get coaching? How do I get involved in this? You know, they see us, you know, because we obviously played tennis before, they've seen us get to a good level and now they're like, you know, I want to do that as well. And then they suddenly realize, where can I play? I can't play anywhere. Or, or, you know, like you say, it's outdoors, so it's raining, so I can't play there. Where can I get coaching? Where can I find players? And actually, that frustration ends up, they end up thinking, oh, actually, I'm not going to bother with this, which is such a shame because they, like you say, all these ex-tennis players that could convert and become really good players, raise the level of the, the paddle in the country, are, are, are just getting frustrated and, and not doing it. Mm. So, um, But I think, I, I do think that it's, it should be something that the LTA, as the Tennis Federation, obviously Paddle is under that federation now, I mean, it should be something that they must be thinking, right, we've spent the last over two, two, two and a half years in, you know, integrating Paddle with Tennis. You know, this would be a great way to boost participation. I, I mean, you, you kind of carried on and went pro in tennis, but there's loads of players that finish their, their junior tennis or they might go to college and, and then they just stop, they lose interest. And, and I think that this would be a great way to, to A, keep players in racket sports and, and keep you know participation levels higher, but also get to a point with paddle where you know, we can we can actually put put together a strong performance pathway. Unfortunately, we don't have the structure or the expertise in it now, but I, I do think that, that that's a massive potential 
for that federation and, and you've got to look at the you know in the tennis world it, it's difficult you know it, it's obviously highly competitive there's loads and loads of countries involved you know in the slams the, the brits tend to go out <laughs> relatively early in the slams and now is a chance in paddle if we could boost it now there's not the same level of competition in paddle so we, we actually stand a chance of actually excelling in this in you know in terms of one of the countries but we have to put that groundwork in now you talk about those players as well that stop tennis perhaps at college a lot of those players will go on to become coaches and mm. i mean i don't know if we want to jump into the the coaching well, how long have you got <laughs> the coaching question yeah. in this podcast but all, all of those players that if they you know, shift from tennis to paddle, start playing well and, and go, you know, training themselves. It's the next generation of paddle coaches as mm. well. But I mean, if I was a tennis coach now and I played a little bit of paddle, I see the value in it. I would, I mean, throw myself into it. I mean, I know, again, the question is, where would you do that? And how would, you know, like, it's, it's not easy, but, but throw myself into it now because this sport is coming. Yeah. I mean, you can't you can't deny it now. Like, you know, a, a few years ago, I was finding this a difficult conversation around. You know, trust me, paddle will grow. But but now everyone can see it, right? So, it, it would be the time to do that. And and you look at I'll use the David Lloyd as an example. I mean, they've got lots of tennis coaches there, and and no one coaching paddle. And you just think that is a, a potential revenue stream for a coach should they really apply themselves and want want to go into it. Before we got onto this subject, we were talking about training. Um, we've got a FIP coming up, so a FIP. We have got. A, we've got a FIP. Yeah, we're, we're playing a, a, an FIP tournament in London end yeah. of the month. We, we You're basically to... bring this up, so you're making me train. Yeah, it's accountable on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now accountable to to the listeners or viewers of the podcast. Yeah, um, yeah. I will. I will yeah. train for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah I, I was actually in the gym this morning doing okay. a bit of training, Perfect. mainly for my shoulder, just to make sure that my shoulder shoulder stays stays strong. And yeah. and I'm not wanting to deflect in any way or change the subject, but... Let's talk about the pairs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to talk about our, our course that we got coming up on oh, the platform. Yeah. We got yeah. our physio course coming up, which I'm really excited about. It's taken, it's taken us a while to, to film the bits and to decide what was important enough to, to put in there. Um, yeah, we've covered quite a few different really common injuries, didn't we? I mean, plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow, shoulder injuries, knee injuries, hip. I mean, we, we covered quite a lot in there as well as strengthening exercises and self-massage with the foam roller and the, the massage balls and things like yeah. that. So um, I'm excited about that. And it seems to be a conversation we have all the time. Yeah. Um, and actually, it was <laughs> going back to this, playing with heavy balls in, at Rains Park, but you know, people start feeling their elbow, they feel their shoulder in those conditions. But even in good conditions, you find players end up playing so much that, um, you know, they, they really need to start considering these things, you know, earlier if they can. Yeah, what I love about the course actually is it's not so much, you know, this is how to fix something because, you know, for everyone that watches it, it's actually going, you know, go to your healthcare provider. It's, it's also so much around what can you do to, to help prevent injuries? Because so many players that, you know, they might get addicted to the sport and they're like, right, I'm playing like five times a week now. I've gone from playing nothing to mm. suddenly, and, and, you know, no matter how good your technique is or anything, like you, you're probably like susceptible to injury there. So all of this is just like, how do you stay on the court longer and, and prevent injury? And that's what that's why you're in the gym, right? For your shoulder, you're not, you're yeah. not injured, but you're you're yeah, preparing yeah. yourself to. Well, not... I'm knowing if we play, like you say, five matches across two three days, that you're gonna you're gonna need that that strength and, and support. And you and I have had our fair share of injuries, and so when we're going through this course, we're we're really like knowing the subject matter. I mean, we've we've been through most of those injuries. I've had, I think, all of the injuries that. That we talked about at some point over the last 20 years uh, so yeah and, and actually you know a lot of them are really easy things that you can just what while you're watching tv in the evening or you're you, you know you're off court waiting for your match or they, they can be part of your warm-up they can be some something that you just do a few exercises here and there and they're all with the view to strength strengthening that 
park your body and and most of the time if you look at the the demographic of people that play paddle they are they've had past injuries so you know that if you've had a previous knee injury or a shoulder injury that you need to keep that strengthened and if there's four or five little exercises that you can do to strengthen the shoulder on an evening with a little TheraBand, then then why not? Like, I mean, it's it, none of them take a long time to do, but they are so important when, when you want to continue playing without injury. Yeah, I, to be honest, I really struggle to find the motivation to do exercises like this. And and the best thing that I always do is I, I put it, like you say, into my warm-up. Hmm. So if I'm going to play, let's say I play a, a few times a week, I always put in like five, ten minutes in my warm-up of these exercises. And that kind of makes me feel that all adds up. Yeah. Whereas if you said to me, oh, I'm going to go to the gym and do my exercises, I just, I just wouldn't have the motivation. But by the side of the court, if I can do them, like I know that over time, like yeah. it will, it will help. So that's. I remember even having plantar fasciitis, and we talk about you know that it was massaging the the sole of your foot and the ball tees. I remember doing that, even you know at, at your desk. So yeah. I mean, a lot of these things they they, and it is cumulative. If you just add a little bit in here or there, it all adds up, and it, it will definitely be worth it so I'm, I'm excited about that coming out that that will be um you know in the next week or week or so won't it and so um and actually on the platform at the moment we're running an easter promotion aren't we yes so a yeah. 30 day free trial to the platform uh it won't be won't be on forever it's limited limited time only but yeah um we'll put it in the in the, in show, the show notes, notes. Yeah, yeah but 30 day free trial to the platform where that physio course will yeah in the, in the very near future be be on there yeah and it combines well with the t we did a trx course as well around you know strength and strength and conditioning and i think it combines really well with that so um i mean we, well we've got so much material on there that that really you shouldn't run out of of things to do or ways to improve improve your paddle but um yeah i'm definitely looking forward to, to that coming out okay so let's go into the changes in the the men's pair and i've actually got a little a little list here um, with the ranking points. So we'll just focus on the men's pair this week as, as there hasn't been um, some major changes with the ladies. But this week, first pair is Cuello Tapia. Obviously they've they've not changed, but I mean, they've, they've had some, you know, a very strong start to the season. As you would expect, particularly on the faster courts, I think we found that, you know, Saudi and, and Qatar both were were pretty fast courts, and I mean those guys can hit. Oh, I watched. I watched the incredible match. Incredible smashes. Uh, Paquito, Sanyo versus those two, and it was just incredible. It was. Uh... They they just uh, the the thing for me is they combine so well their ability to defend with the firepower of their overheads. Yeah. And and it's one of those. I mean, particularly Tapia. You you think that he is out of a point. I mean, you watch it and you think there's no way he's getting back yeah. into this point. And not only is he getting back into the point, but he he's almost turning it around, counter-attacking from such a difficult position to a winning opportunity within a shot or two. And it's it's phenomenal to watch. And and if you watched it just one point, you'd say he's he's just being a bit lucky. But but actually, I mean, he consistently yeah. consistently does that. And I. I remember watching live when I watched Cuello recently, I think it was the end of the, the Master Final. I mean, he was so good defensively, wasn't he? Mm. It was just, you know, putting that ball in, into position. I mean, he's quite a, quite a tall guy. I think he's 6'3", and he, he just... Yeah, you think able... for someone that size, they wouldn't be able to yeah. have the hands and the feel and the... I mean, it, those two, I mean, it's obviously not a new pair, but I mean, they're, they're, they're continually... Um, impressing me and and actually last year they started really strong the first I would say the first kind of third quarter of the season and then they didn't kind of peter off but it, it, it was almost like they they couldn't have kept up the winning streak that they were on but but now I think you know we're gonna see a very a very strong season from them and so obviously I mean the big news for last week was um, Galan and LeBron splitting up so so they had that match in in Qatar uh, the, the one with um, Garrido and, and Yanguas and, and and obviously there was a little bit of aggro in that yeah, match with, on that. Yeah. Yeah, with yeah. LeBron and, and Yanguas and um, for you, for those that didn't see that there was basically a uh, they 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 called a footfall on LeBron stepping over the line um, on his serve which is well within the rights of Mickey Yanguas to call that and and Garrido to to, to call that release to to ask for for the umpire's view. Um, and then LeBron reacted 
as he can do with um, you know a, a little bit of firepower of his own and he, he almost tried to hit the angles with the ball and it it kind of it left a very uh, yeah, it, it left it a very kind of difficult situation, I think, you know, and, and then they ended up losing. And then, you know, that was obviously, I think, probably the final straw for Galan. They, they've been talking before about splitting up as a pair, but I think it was something that, um, you know, pushed Galan a little bit further. And, um, you know, a couple of days later, Galan kind of announced it. He obviously told LeBron first and all of this, but but announced that they were, were splitting up. And so... I mean that's a that's a massive power couple that are are now separating and and I mean they've had what an era they've had I mean they they've they've won so many tournaments and and it was almost the first case of LeBron playing on the right someone with that kind of intensity or firepower on the right hand side and on the left they were almost there was a phase where they were just unstoppable yeah it will be interesting to see how long well we don't know long term they might they might come back together at some point we'll see won't we yeah i mean the difficulty now though is now all of the other pairs have adjusted and split and and gone with each other so it's it's not like a tennis doubles where you you can decide a couple of weeks later were they to do that then they've in a way disrupted you know a handful of handful of pairs but um Paquito is going to play with lebron so they'll come in at the as the number number two seeds um mainly because LeBron, well, Paquito has a lot of points himself, but LeBron has a, has a lot of points. And and I think that will be a really interesting pair. I mean, Paquito and LeBron have played together for Spain several times, and so they, they always play well together. Um, and again, you've got firepower on both sides. So I think, I don't think Paquito is quite as explosive as Galan, but... Um, what, one thing I think he does really well is almost the tactics of the situation, doesn't he? He has the weapons, maybe not quite to the extent of Galan, but he, he is definitely a tactician. Um, and and LeBron, I think it will come down to the chemistry with LeBron. It doesn't look easy to be LeBron's partner, to be honest. <laughs> well, if anyone can, Paquito. Yeah. Give, give Paquito that chance. Well, that, that's it, isn't it? We'll and see. It, it's, 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 not, it, it's not easy because I know that, you know, he, he wears his heart on his sleeve, doesn't he, LeBron? But... Um, and then the third pair in the rankings is Dineno Stupa. Now they're obviously not a new pair. They're playing re really well at the moment. Solid. That we're obviously big fans, big fans of them. Um, and I think you know, particularly on the slower courts, they're going to be very, very dangerous, um, as always. And then pair number four is Galan Chingotto, which I think is going to be really exciting. Yeah, interesting. That's, I think a lot of people are really looking forward to to that pairing. Um, and it'll, it'll be exciting, I think, to, to see that. And I think it's, it's definitely, for Chingotto, I think that obviously we, we saw him a couple of weeks ago in Madrid. It'll be someone that will be really dangerous on the left for him to set up on the right. I think when he played with Momo, it's, it's not quite the same. Um, you know, Galan is obviously just such a, a beast, isn't he, on the court, both in terms of his physicality, but also finishing points. Um, and then as we move down the list, we got uh, Bella and Teo. Yeah. So so that'll be get again interesting, assuming that Bella will play on the right, um, which which he's done before a couple of seasons ago. We, he did that with Tapia actually, and it it didn't. It, it's funny. Bella has obviously played so many years on the left. It's not. It's now not easy to make to make that shift. Yeah. Um, but I mean, they'll they'll again be a, a force a force to be reckoned with, um, you know. And 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 Teo is is we saw him again in Madrid, and he's yeah. he's athletic, uh, you know, really attacking, great weapons. Again, you know, really, you know, really exciting player to watch. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see with these new pairs who who comes out who comes out of the uh, the mist a little bit, right? We interest to see who. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were talking about. Paquito and Sanyo playing together again. I thought, oh, that'd be really exciting. I, I love watching Sanyo play. I mean, incredible hands. He's now going to be playing with Maxi Sanchez, which is a real blast from the past. I think when I first started in paddle, they were a pair uh, together. And so I think they're going to struggle to make to make the top. Um, but it's going to be, it's, it's definitely going to be exciting. And I think you know, Cuello and Tapia now are the pair to beat. Now LeBron and Galan have split, but I mean, these that that split has left 
some really exciting pairs to watch. And I think depending on the speed of the court, a lot of people talking about, uh, the, you know, the game needs to change because, the, you know, it's so fast and the rallies are short. You've got to understand that, you know, Saudi and Qatar are, are, are two very kind of hot environments in, in that the ball is, is, is then fast. Um, but also we saw this five or six years ago. It's part of the reason they changed the World Paddle Tour surface and now they have different pressure on ball to play altitude on fast courts and uh, and slightly less pressure on, you know, on uh, on those ones. But yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's going to be really, really exciting. And because now the game is internationally around the world, there's events all over the world, there are going to be different style courts and different speed courts and, um, yeah, I'm excited. I mean, I'm definitely excited to watch these these next few tournaments. On the topic of pairings, I'm just thinking for all the recreational players out there that probably also have questions about who they should pair up with. How important do you think it is to play with someone that you have experience playing with, so someone that you've played a lot with, versus a new pair, so playing with someone who's probably a higher level than your partner, so they're a higher level, you think potentially it could work quite well, but you've played with another partner for so long that like almost that competitive advantage of playing with someone for so long versus playing with someone who's probably a higher level than your partner how do you make that how do you make that choice it's quite a difficult one isn't it it is a difficult one and and when we speak to to the pros and 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 the same for us when we play i think the number one thing about a new partner is is chemistry like i, I think that's more important than you know the technique or who's got a big smash or you've got this there or i think it's i think it's it's chemistry i think there is a a level of hey look you you like to play this style of game i like to play this style of game and and do do the games match but i think a lot of it comes down to the mental side and i mean it is such a key regardless of your level if you're if you're playing any kind of matches, whether they're social friend matches or club games or FIP tournaments, it, it comes down to the mental side of the game. And, and it's, it's, it's not easy. It's one of those that you, you immediately feel good chemistry, but then also it does take time to, you've got a new, a new partnership. You need to kind of get on the same page in terms of communication and, and what's the good style if you know we play together or you know you play with someone else it's almost how can you make your style work with that new player you need a level of adaptability and i think it it takes it, it takes time to get that it's difficult isn't it because you start thinking what what is that time like what's that time frame yeah because you start playing together you think oh you just it's going to take time you yeah. know it might not be where it is where we want to but you see the potential of it it's difficult you know when, when is that time we go do you know what now it is time to... Well, it's a bit like in football when they change managers, isn't it? Mm. You know, get a new manager, how much, how much is the right amount of time? And you see managers being, you know, you lose three three matches or three games or whatever, and, and, and the manager is being booted out, and you're thinking, how have they, how have they had time to, to, <laughs> yeah. to, to prove that? And I think, um, yeah, it does, it does take time. I mean, at this, at the top end, though, that group are all friends. So they've all probably played with each other at some point and, you know, they know each other really well and they they know who they're playing. I mean, when we spoke to Paquito, the last time he played someone that he didn't know, I mean, is, is years ago. You know, it's not quite the same at recreational level or, you know, you, your match of the weekend, you probably played three or four opponents you'd never played before, yeah, yeah. you know. And so I think it, it does change at that level. but. Again, it, 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 yeah, I think it, it goes down to chemistry, putting that time in together, being patient. Um, and, you know, I think it's, if you continue the communication, you either reach the point where you find that it's going really well together, or you reach a point where you both agree that you may again need to go separate ways. But either way, you're, it's transparent and you and your partner know that. Well, we've got the we've got the fit coming up. Just to mention it again. <laughs> yeah, you're looking so, for a new partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> After this chat, is this you breaking it, now... breaking it down gently for yeah. me? Yeah, no, yeah. No, I'm looking. I am looking forward to that. That'll yeah. be good. Yeah, we'll yeah, get good. training. And the week ahead, Sandy, we got got some training coming up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, got some training coming up. Got some filming. Um, I mean, the filming is 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 a weekly thing, isn't it? And I'm actually going back to to the David Lloyd's, and I'm I'm praying for some good weather. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it'd be good. Yeah, well, Sam, it's always a pleasure to get on the podcast couch with you. And if we do well at the fit, then we'll let you know 
how it went in the podcast. Yeah. And, and, and if, if you don't hear yeah. about it, then you'll know that it didn't go that well. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, <laughs> we'll forget about that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I look forward to it. Cheers. Bye.